Hi, I'm Paul Yuknovich. I'm the Group Program Manager for the Azure SDK and Tools Group in Microsoft. What I'm going to do today is take you through a tour of what's new for Azure developers. We'll look in particular at what's new in Visual Studio 2015, and also what's new in the Azure SDK 2.6. You can use that SDK on Visual Studio 2012, 2013, and 2015. What we'll cover is mostly through demos. We're going to show you how to get started building applications that use the cloud or that natively deploy to the cloud. I'll show you some techniques that you can use um, for IaaS using Azure Resource Groups, which lets you define topologies and then keep them treated as config as code in your solutions. We'll also look at diagnostics tools that we have and techniques that you can use to prevent issues. Last but not least, I'll show you how all these assets can flow into your development lifecycle. So let's get started. Let's first get started by taking a tour around the IDE and looking at what's new. First thing, if we look in the top right-hand corner, we've been able to sign into Visual Studio for a while. But what's new now is we connect to your Azure subscriptions as a part of signing into Visual Studio. So if I check my account settings, I'm going to see that any Azure subscriptions I have tied to this account are also enumerated. So here I have my Azure account with my MSDN subscription. And I can actually have multiple accounts, and we'll give you the ability to toggle between subscriptions and accounts as you work with resources. Also, you can go to Server Explorer, and this is where we'll show you all the services and resources in Azure that dynamically enumerate from your subscriptions. You can right-click on the Azure node. One thing to highlight here is you have more control now than ever. You can control the accounts that you're looking at. You could filter them down. Um, you can also decide not to look at some of your subscriptions or not to look at some of the regions. And the reason we did that is we've gotten a lot of feedback that um, cloud developers tend to build up a lot of resources and it gets a little bit unwieldy. So this gives you the ability to filter down those resources and take control of the views that you have. And for those of you that like to work with uh, management certificates or published settings files, we still offer a way for you to connect your subscriptions that way. The next thing we want to do is get started building a cloud application. So we'll go to File New. We'll create a new project. There's two places that I always think about for cloud applications. I think about the cloud node, where we have a set of uh, back-end cloud service types. Also, you know, a lot of our cloud development starts with web development. So you can always take any ASP.NET or web project, and we give you intrinsic support to um, enable cloud services like App Insights and also to host it in the cloud. Also, if you look at the cloud node, um, you can build from there and work with a number of different cloud compute types. So we have cloud services, that's our PaaS offering. We also see ASP.NET websites and app services here. And um, we support mobile, and we even have this new Azure Resource Group project. This is a way now using Azure Resource Manager uh, to get a better way to define a complete IaaS-based topology that includes all of your resources, so like websites, SQL servers, um, VMs, any of those resources. You can define that topology just like you can define your application code. Let's go back, and we're going to get started creating a web application. So we'll pick ASP.NET. Um, I'm going to create this into my MSDN subscription. And I can see that App Insights is turned on, which is cool. So I'll get some monitoring and usage analytics. Um, you know, I have all the standard options for creating MVC applications, um, ASP.NET, Web APIs, even ASP.NET 5 Preview. Um, also, you can see that by default, we give you the option to host this application in the cloud. What that means is we'll spin up a dev test container for you, either as a web app or using a virtual machine. And that means you always have a dev test host environment um, that's ready to use, and you don't have to worry about configuring your machine or getting all the customization that give you that production realism. Let's go ahead and create the application. All right, and then I'm presented with a few options because we're going to provision this container on the cloud. Nice web app name here. Again, we have control over the subscriptions. Uh, I'm going to co-locate it in a region that's close to me. So I'll pick West US. 
Um, we even have the option to create a SQL DB server in Azure and use that. We'll hit OK. You know, and then as a part of the project creation, I'm also getting the server resources that I need. With my solution created, I can see Visual Studio created not just the web application, the MVC web application, but it's also created a set of lifecycle scripts for me. I can open this PowerShell file, and I can see that this application is ready to deploy from the command line using PowerShell. And we follow lifecycle patterns, like we give you um, a set of parameter files. Like here, I'm looking at a JSON file for my dev settings. I could also have test, pre-production, production, and so on. And again, this is an example of how we integrate with the cloud lifecycle. And these files and these assets can be consumed um, by the lifecycle services that we have downstream or through your favorite automation tool that you're using. So let's do something more interesting with this project. Let's go ahead and connect to other cloud services. So when I want to do that, we've created a new feature in Visual Studio 2015 where you can add a connected service. I can see here that on the left-hand side, we have a number of vendors or providers. So Microsoft offers some. And there's even the ability for third parties to plug in like Salesforce. You know, taking the example of Azure Storage, now I can easily consume the service um, and pull down all the information from the cloud. So by picking Storage, this dialog will look into my subscription. It'll find all of the Azure Storage accounts that I have access to, and it'll enumerate them. And one thing that's helpful, I can see which subscription and region it's coming from to make sure I'm actually picking the right one. One other thing we mentioned before is you can always toggle between accounts. That way, if you tend to work with different clients or you work in different billing contexts, you can easily change that. So let's go ahead and pick my storage, and I'll click Add. Now it's happening. Not only do we add the conventional NuGet package, which gives me the client library to program against the service, also we already know the information you need to connect to the service, and we create a connection string for you. Um, we create a setting in web config or app config or cloud config. And we'll even give you the next set of steps and the next set of snippets so that it's really easy to write that first transactional line of code. Now with my project configured, I can see the first thing that pops up is a web page in my browser. And what it'll tell me how to do is really how to get started and make the most of the storage reference. So I can see very easily there's a set of code I can simply copy and paste and drop into my solution, including the namespaces I need, how to initialize the object, working with that named connection string that sits in my config file, um, how to initialize the objects, and even just how to do tasks like creating containers, updating, deleting, transferring, and a number of things like that. So we think this will really give you a jump start to get connected to any service, um, configure it correctly with a lifecycle pattern, and get into using it the way you wanted to. Now let's look at how we make it easier to build a more sophisticated application based on a template. We'll go to File New. We'll go to Cloud. And we'll pick this Azure Resource Group. Again, we're going to use Azure Resource Manager as the base technology, which allows me to pick a template which defines not just one service, but it, it defines a complete topology. Um, we're looking at a dynamic list right now in this dialog. This is all pulled from the cloud. When you look at this video, you might actually see more templates that you can use. Uh, what I'll show you today, let's start with a web app. And as you can see, this scales all the way to custom VMs. Uh, we have a Dockerized Ubuntu or Linux server, and we have a, a complete blank slate. Again, let's pick the web. So we'll pull this template and topology from the cloud. Let's take a look at what we get. First thing let's focus on is the template itself. So a template is expressed as JSON. Um, the JSON has a number of resources. You could think of those like services. And then there's a set of parameters that we work with to configure those resources. Um, now, if you're like me, um, your eyes might glaze over looking at a little bit too much JSON, which can't be helped. So the nice thing is we have tools that help you with that. We have this JSON outline, which breaks the file down visually, so you have a set of resources. And now I can see, oh, I have a website, I have a hosting plan, which basically helps me with my SKUs. I have some diagnostics and trace um, analytics info. And 
I can kind of go from there. I can pick any one of these resources and it's going to help me navigate through the JSON file and take me exactly where I want to go. Um, I can go ahead and be a code focused person at this point and start typing in. You'll see that you get IntelliSense for JSON based on the schema. You'll get colorization. Um, or if you just want a simple shortcut uh, because you haven't memorized the JSON, you can actually go ahead and right click in the outline on a resource and say add new resource. Now here, again, we're going to look to an online gallery, but this time it's a gallery of snippets. And you can take really common resource types, like we have SQL servers, we have storage accounts, we have networking artifacts, um, we have additional web apps. Okay, so like one interesting thing to do, let's add a SQL database. We'll call it simple, like this will be my uh, customer database. And I don't have a SQL server defined, so we can just go ahead and mock one up on the fly as well. All right, and just in that simple step, we've actually created the definition for that SQL server topology, and I didn't have to do any typing at all. Now, at this point, this is the logical part where we do the customization that only we know um, in our dev teams and with our ops teams. And um, to help you with that configuration, we've actually taken the parameters and we've separated that from the core definition. So you can maintain one or more parameter files, or you could think of environment configurations that sit beside the template itself. So we'd take a little bit more time at this point and we'd define, hey, for dev environment, here are the parameters I want, where I could add a test or a pre-prod environment as well. And the nice thing is if we have a different administrator who's operating the production service, they can at that point, take a secure parameters file and inject that um, later down the loop, something that I couldn't do as a developer. Now also, one core tenet we have is that everything we do is absolutely automatable. So we give you the PowerShell script um, that can also deploy this template in the set of parameters to Azure. And then Azure Resource Manager service on the back end will go ahead and provision all this stuff for me. Um, so at this point, I could take this file. I can um, run it in line from Visual Studio, from our editor. I could run it at the command line. I could chain it into lifecycle management solution of my choice. Another thing that's really easy to do for dev test, you can right click on the project and you can simply say deploy. The nice thing here about this deploy dialog is it makes it easy to deploy, but it's still using this PowerShell script and template file underneath. So all the customizations I've done as a developer will actually be used by the Visual Studio UI. And we think this gives you a lot of flexibility. So let's go ahead, we'll, we'll pick a, actually pick Mike's subscription, because he's letting me use that. Um, I could pick an existing resource group, and that's something that you would do if you're over and over redeploying. In this case, we'll create a new one. And again, I'll pick something close to us. We'll hit create. That's just provisioning a container for us. And now you can see, here's the actual template that we can deploy. We recognize you might have multiple of them. And then here's the parameters file that has the environmental configuration. And in this case, because we didn't uh, go ahead and define all the parameter values, now is the first point where I'm going to type them in. Um, and once we've typed them in, it'll be forever saved. And we don't have to keep typing them in any, every time. So this is just a one-time thing. All right, now that all the parameters are typed in, you can see that the password is masked and we won't save it to the configuration by default. That's actually a best practice. The tool will go ahead and start to deploy and any parameters that are still missing like a password will prompt you again so that we don't persist it by default. We'll hit OK and you can even see the trace in the output window. We're actually invoking that PowerShell file with all the parameters, and we're standing up that more sophisticated resource group in the cloud for you. Now I'm seeing in the output trace that I've successfully deployed the template, and that means all of the resources along with it. We can go to Server Explorer, and we can get some optics now on what just happened. So let's go ahead and refresh that. And we can see that the web app and the related resources have been deployed. 
So now all of those resources and that complete topology, you can see how easy it is to use Visual Studio and stand that up uh, for your dev test needs. So let's switch gear and diagnose a cloud application. So the first thing that I want to do is just get my ambient errors and get my exceptions. Now by default, all of our cloud applications, cloud services and IaaS applications are wired up to do diagnostics by default. So if I want to view the diagnostics data, all I need to do is go to the Server Explorer, right click on any particular service and service instance, and view diagnostics data. If I'm in the situation where I still haven't enabled diagnostics for some reason, I can always enable or disable diagnostics or update the diagnostics collection plan at any time. And this happens dynamically using a set of agents. Let's go ahead and view the diagnostics data. I can see the ambient errors, exceptions, and trace errors automatically in the summary. When I expand the event logs, I'm seeing a form of a startup error. In this case, I can see that I have a storage exception on initialization in the create if not exist part of the stack. And I think I know what that is because when I create a storage connection, I look at a config file to find the connection string, and I don't think I remember to initialize that in the cloud. All this data is actually saved in Azure Table Storage. So if I want to, at any time, look at all the raw data or do some queries over the data by a timestamp or by some other criteria, I can open the Query Builder and have a much more powerful experience for querying my diagnostics. In this version of Visual Studio and the Azure SDK, we enable a much more sophisticated form of diagnostics and logging. You can use something called ETW event sources. The event sources allow a developer to define logical events and logical stages of their application workflow. And we can use these stages and we can use these events IDs to describe and identify where you're at in your application in all tiers as you're diagnosing your app. So here we've defined an event source class. And by default, our diagnostic tooling can pick up this event source class and we can emit additional information called ETW traces. When I want to look at the ETW traces, I do just what I did before. I can right click on an instance. I can view diagnostics data. And I can immediately see a summary of the ETW logs with valuable IDs and messages. I can also view all data. And again, I can see really helpful information like what was the task name where a particular error occurred, and what was the payload of data that was being sent at the time. Last but not least, when I experience a really tricky diagnostic scenario, I can go ahead and attach a debugger to that instance. In this case, we can debug all remote processes in our cloud service, ISVM, or website. Now that we've shown several diagnostics and debugging approaches, we want to show you some tools that we have that will help you avoid creating some of those scale issues in the first place. Let's open one of our business logic files. When I do that, I can see that some cloud code analysis is kicking in, detecting issues and suggesting some warnings and things that I should take action on. If I click this first one, this is referring to my storage shared access policy expiry time code. And based on our experience with customers and in the field and with support, we know that this should always be set to more than five minutes. Let's go ahead and change that. And automatically I can see that error going away. Second thing is that we set a start time to UTC now. That's actually not a practice that we recommend at all. If I hover over to the left-hand side, I can see that this code analysis rule will actually suggest a code fix that I can do. I can preview that in the preview pane, and if I like it, I can apply the fix. And this gives you the idea of how we can bring different code analysis rules to bear to help you learn about and fix common scale issues in a cloud application. All right, so now that we've seen the demo, I want to highlight some of the capabilities that you all need to go and try in the Azure SDK. So thinking about the Azure SDK 2.6, we have a number of platform improvements that'll make working with DevOps a lot better. So go check out the Azure Resource Manager tools that really help you define topologies. Also, we have a suite of diagnostics tools. 
um, that start with the basics for viewing and searching that go all the way to semantic logging. We have a remote debugger for all of the different containers and services that we work with. And even for those of you who are trying to get that next level of custom viewing and searching at scale, we've been working on a GitHub project that lets you work with Elk. Elk is an OSS project that's outstanding for viewing and searching, and it has a lot of plugins to work with different log stashes. Um, so you can go check that out on our blog. All of this integrates with your lifecycle, um, so you can connect to um, a command line or an automated process or to Visual Studio Online. And for command line developers, we continue to make updates to PowerShell and the CLI tools. So thinking about Visual Studio 2015, we also made some integral updates there too. You can sign into your Azure account, you can work with multiple accounts, and we made a ton of improvements in that line. You can go use Azure itself for your developer environment. So you can go provision Visual Studio images in the cloud, it works with a whole number of scenarios, and anywhere in the world you can go ahead and use that. There's new platform services that continue to come out. App services and web jobs are really important ones. We have integrated tools for that. And for those of you connecting to services, we made it a lot easier to consume services. So check out the connected services dialog. That continues to grow all the time. Um, right now we have support for storage, for enterprise single sign-in, for Office, even for Salesforce. So we've got some really cool stuff going on there. And the last thing that I think is really neat is we've been working with Adam Driscoll in the community. He's got an outstanding set of PowerShell tools. So uh, we made some contributions to that to help make sure it works really well with web and cloud scenarios. And we've actually linked to that inside of Visual Studio. So that's something every Visual Studio developer now has great PowerShell tools. Uh, for those of you who have an MSDN benefit, you have an Azure benefit that comes with it. It's worth up to 150 US dollars in credits. It also gives you a number of images that you wouldn't otherwise have. So definitely go turn that on if you have it. Everything you saw today, um, you can download on our website on azure.com. So we have a downloads page for you there. Um, we have great how-tos and tutorials on the documentation site. And we have more discussions about what we do, how we do things, and why we do them on the Azure blog. Um, also, you know, for Visual Studio 2015, you can go get that on visualstudio.com. So anyway, once again, we took a tour through the Azure SDK and tools. We saw how we could build apps. We saw how we could connect to services. And we saw how we can integrate with the cloud lifecycle. Thank you very much.